Welcome to Fading Memories, a supportive podcast for those of us caring for a loved one with memory loss. With me today is Helene. I did get that right. Helene Berger. She is the author of Choosing Joy, Alzheimer's, A Book of Hope. And don't we all need some hope? The book was inspired by the unanticipated positive results her husband achieved after his diagnosis of Alzheimer's. So thank you for being with me, Helene. It is a pleasure to be with you. And before we even begin, I want to thank you for the wonderful work you are doing, helping so many people. Appreciate it very, very deeply. Thank you. So what was the inspiration for the book besides your wonderful husband, 80? Huh. Well, it wasn't supposed to be a book. <laughs> I never dreamed of writing a book. Um, and uh, what happened was every time I found that I did something that worked, I made little notes to myself so I'd remember what they were. And uh, I started thinking, he was diagnosed with six years, I started thinking near the end that, you know, some of these ideas might really help a lot of people, but I still didn't believe I would do it. And later on, I gathered all of my notes and spent about eight years <laughs> deciding what, what to do with them. I mean, the work, kind of working on them halfway. And then finally, um, I, I said, you really do have something here. You've got to go, go with it. Um, but I think, I think in this moment in history, when we're living through the COVID virus, we have to put it all in context. And none of us ever knows what's happened, what's, what the future is. We know where life is full of the unexpected. I don't think we've ever dealt with an unexpected in any of our lives, and maybe perhaps a war, uh, this, this severe and this serious. And I think, I think it leads very well into the, your question and of, of, of our lives. When, when we're faced with a situation where we see a loved one declining, whatever the reason, whether it's uh, Alzheimer's, dementia, prostate cancer, or heart trouble, uh, we're never prepared. And I think what we, if life is so full of the unexpected, it's we have to figure out how we're going to react to that. What are we going to do? And the way we react determines whether we're frustrated and angry uh, or whether we're content and at peace. And I think, in a sense, that really sums up what the whole book is about. Because luckily, without, unwittingly, I, I chose a course that gave each of us the chance to succeed. I know uh, there's an amazing... Um, person, uh, author, Victor Frankl, who is a, a psychiatrist and, 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 a, and a wonderful author and wrote many books. And in one of those books, in Man's Search for Meaning, he writes something that is always with me. And he writes, and he, he, was, he came through, I would say, he came through the Nazi death camps and saw it all. And coming from that experience, he says, the thing that no one can take away from us is the right to choose our attitude. And I think that's probably what helped me so much through this whole experience. Choosing Joy describes throughout the book how powerfully our actions, our attitude, our frustration or support affects our loved one and they affect our loved one in a powerful way and it's the attitude that we choose to bring to our loved one that can either diminish or or demean or agitate or or bring support and contentment and dignity and i wasn't this wise when i started out <laughs> it took me a long time to see what was happening. And I, I do want to say something before, uh, very important. You were telling me as we chatted before uh, this phone started about what's happening with your mom and, um, and, and how serious and how important it is. And I want to say to you and to 
all your listeners in the future that I am offering what worked for us. Our result was so rare. And I don't want to come off in a Pollyannish way and say, well, if you've done what I did, you know, I, that's the last thing I want because there are no guarantees. Every relationship is important. And, and the way we deal with it is important. And in some cases, where it depends where the brain is damaged. Mm -hmm. In some cases, the, the, the part of the brain is so damaged that nobody will ever have the, res the result I was fortunate enough to get. And that's really what inspired the book. He inspired the book because of how, how he came along. But I don't want to imply that it's one's fault if they don't. The odds are not that they're going to have this. But I do say that there are in hundreds and thousands of caregivers have given their best. They care deeply and they've given love and devotion beyond measure and still end up with someone who doesn't know their name or maybe violent. And that's, that depends on where it is. So regardless of your relationship, the thing that I want people to take away from the book, no matter what the relationship is, I truly believe that the evolving methodology described throughout the book has, not, not a guarantee, but has the potential, has the potential to benefit both the patient and the caregiver. And especially if it's introduced early enough. Once someone, when, when the habit of fighting back and anger is there, it's, it's very difficult, very difficult to change. So that's well, I, I completely agree with that. And as I mentioned offline, that the way we handled it in our family, the way it ha was handled from the beginning, basically I can see now how, how things were handled in the beginning, and that includes my mom's denial that she had problems, how that is now affecting who she is now. She had an appointment, well, the physical therapist came to her residence last week to assess her she technically should have surgery to put the bones back together, but with somebody with her diagnosis, that's really not the best course of action. It, it is one option I could choose, but I don't think that that would be wise for many reasons. And she needs physical therapy to have any potential of being able to walk as she was before. And she fought with him. She was swinging at him, and she was swearing at him. Now, what and you're describing is the typical is the typical behavior. That's that's much more usual than what I have. And after reading your whole book, which I don't always get a chance to do the entire book before I talk to somebody, so I don't know if that's because, well, it's raining. There's a lot of reasons that I had more time lately. But my dad was not the easiest person and he wasn't he was a much more negative person and i don't know if they were both in denial or if he just went along with her denial i just know it took years and years for her to be diagnosed by the time she was diagnosed it was basically oh yeah duh <laughs> you don't need to be a doctor to be able to tell me that she's got this problem it was so obvious i mean she as I've said before, flunked all the memory exams with flying colors. It, she was like at least mid stages by the time she was diagnosed. And my dad would get frustrated and snap, you know, just, you know, she'd ask a question a second time and he'd just lose his cool, not yelling and screaming, but just not a nice tone of voice. And I would tell him, you know, I don't think that helps because now you've agitated her. And now she's irritated at you, so she's not going to work with you, and she needs to. Well, I was talking to the wall, I think, which was not unusual. That's kind of how our relationship always was. So when I say our family did everything wrong from the beginning, if he could nobody, have had... Nobody does any, everything. Nobody. Well, this is true. You if do he had the had the... Thing. That's true. And I know. And, and he had his own chronic illnesses... So to deal with his own issues on, and her issues was probably far more than he should have been dealing with. But he, um, 
he was very reluct reluctant to he never they never got help until he was on hospice and that was a mistake and i knew that was a mistake but you know you can only try to persuade somebody for so long and then you just stop beating your own head on the wall because you're frustrating yourself and you're frustrating them and you're not getting anywhere so you need to just quit that nonsense which is what i did so it was after he passed away three years ago that i realized that she was much further along than I thought and because now she didn't have him to cover for her. So I, I have a lot of insight on how we should handle things from the very beginning, which unfortunately I never had the opportunity to do. So that's a little bit of background on, you know, how, how you might be able to make this work, but you, but you like you said, you really do need to um, start as early as possible. Because like you said, once you get into the, the negative feedback, which my parents had a lot before either one of them were chronically ill, you know, it just, it's really difficult to, to get off that path and onto a more positive one. Um, you know, go ahead. Every, everybody, everybody goes through regrets. I would have, could have, should have. What I really like to do, I have so much, uh, in the hour we have together, I have so much information that I think would be really helpful uh, to your listeners that mm -hmm. I'd, I'd like to impart whatever I, whatever. No, I, certainly. That's what I was going to get You know to. what? Let me, let me start with the story. Let okay. Me start, let me start with the history very, very briefly. Um, and that is that because we're just talking about it kind of in the middle. Uh, my husband uh, was officially diagnosed with Alzheimer's after our 50th uh, wedding anniversary, very shortly after our 50th wedding anniversary. And I must say that, oh, and the, the diagnosis was really interesting because we sat at the, the, the Wien Center for Memory Disorder, the head of the center, and when the doctor pronounced the words, three words, you have Alzheimer's, my husband's immediate response, quiet, calm, not emotional was simply uh, four words, three words. I don't want to live anymore. And during the first year of his life, he went down the typical Alzheimer's path with frustration and irritability and, and rigidity and annoyance. And fortunately for me, never violence, never, never that. But, uh, but highly, also highly inappropriate behavior. And fast forward a year, um, he became known as the man with the radiant smile, full of joy of life. And I have to tell you, the, um, the last night, uh, unexpectedly, the last night of his life, because he was healthy, going beautifully, and improving and improving and improving. So the last night of his life, we took 17 friends out to dinner. Thank you to them. And I purposely didn't tell him who, who was coming because I didn't want him to feel the pressure of having to remember the names. They walked in and he greeted every one of those friends by name. Six years, six years into Alzheimer's. And then he sat down at the table. He was then in a wheelchair. We'll talk about it later, but he fractured his hip two and a half years before the end, he was in a wheelchair. And he sat at the table and unbeknownst to me, raised his glass of water he never drank. And he made the most articulate, profound toast, thanking the people for their caring, for their friendship, for their calls, for taking care of me. And two of our close friends, as they were leaving, said the identical words, are you sure he's got Alzheimer's? Which, which of course he did. So that's, that's the beginning. And, um, and I can say that it, it's the way we interacted with each other that made the difference because that first year he was going down <laughs> the, the typical path. And, um, you know, we, we worked hard to, to change that and I'm happy to discuss some of those methods. And, and why? Oh, that's perfect. I have one quick question on the diagnosis. Yes. Um, you had 
well, you still do. You have two children and four grandchildren. Yes. So when he was diagnosed, did you tell them right away? Oh, my goodness. <laughs> First of all, uh, my son uh, is a cardiologist. Our daughter is a professor. I didn't have to tell them anything because they saw him decline. And, um, it, and they were in on, even though they don't live in where I do, they live in another city, they were part of every step I made. And I'll get to, the, what you're leading to now is the acceptance, I'll get to that later. But they were a part of, and, and it was not a surprise, they saw him slipping. And even our grandchildren, some were too young, but one was 15 or 16, and asked the most tender, that they all adored him, he was, he was a beautiful man. And she asked the most tender and profound questions. Uh, and it was, and they, they were in the book, but mm -hmm. it very, very, very involved. So how did, how did we work together? I didn't bring this change about by myself. I uh, think that togetherness is important because I always felt, I always knew my dad needed more help with mom and I was willing to provide what I could, but I could not get past his barrier of he would take care of it. He didn't need it. They were fine, blah, 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 blah. And that was a mistake. It was a mistake for him. No, don't, don't keep saying mistake. We do the best. <laughs> well, this is true. Hindsight is wonderful. We can change the world if of Hindsight. So yes. Don't, don't be so hard on yourself, please. Oh, no, I know. I... No, you didn't make a mistake. You did. Oh, he did. <laughs> and that's, that's a very important point that I should be talking about when I speak. We all do the best we can. I was fortunate. And I was fortunate because I had, I had a beautiful husband who we were very close. And instead of fighting me, he, he understood. He understood from the very beginning, even when he was going downhill, that I wanted what was best for him and best for us. So... I started to change after, after a whole year of watching him go down with, I watched him with Howard, who's a very bright man and a kind gentleman. And um, I realized what was happening and I began to understand that, and this is really important, I could not change him, but I could change myself. And that was one of the key, the key realizations that help. And after 50 years of marriage, you know somebody pretty well. And uh, I was sensitive to his every mood and he was sensitive to mine. And slowly, I began to observe how my actions were contributing to his decline. And I'll give you an example. Um, one of the universally known symptoms of Alzheimer's is the patient asks the question over and over and over again. And uh, I think all of us I try very hard on the first or the second, or maybe even the third, try to answer it sweetly. And by the fourth or fifth or sixth time, there's a little <laughs> or a lot of frustration comes in. And we may, not, we may, say, it, we may say the same words. You may say the same words, but by that time, most of us, and I'm sure I'm not, was not alone, will answer with either an intake of breath or a raised eyebrow or some nonverbal or just, just a sigh, a nonverbal communication which says to the patient or to your loved one, uh, I've told you that a thousand times already. And it, that frustration comes in. And one night when I did that, I saw that it was a punch in the gut to him. And I was determined, I am not going to do that again to this beautiful man. If, and my mantra was, if he remembered, he wouldn't be asking. How can I be annoyed and frustrated with him? if he doesn't remember. And so little by little, um, I, I, I would answer, if it was the seventh or eighth time, I would say, sweetheart, I'm going to the ballet with Elaine tonight. And sometimes he would even say, but sweetly, 
And if, if he asked again, sometimes he would just sort of smile because he remembered that he had asked me, he'd asked, asked me before. And watching his reaction, I was just made that determination. And by the way, another mantra that I had uh, later on, I'm trying to think what the other one was, um, oh, that he didn't, uh, he, didn't, he didn't ask for this disease for himself or for me. <laughs> so instead of feeling blame, well, why don't you do it better? Uh, so that, that simple thought, and, it, and I can sum it up because this is the theme through the entire book. It's the one simple thought through all of it was the more we react with compassion, with tenderness, with simple kindness, rather than frustration, and annoyance, the more we will have a, a, a cooperative response back. And that is, that is crucial. And over and over and over. And when differences uh, uh, came up, and they surely did, um, I tried so hard, consciously at this point, consciously, um, not, to, not to respond to them with anger, but with loving words and kindness. And let me tell you, that is not easy to do. It sounds easy. It's magic. <laughs> That's true. It, it is absolutely magic. And, um, and, and then I thought of the mantra that, you know, he didn't ask for this either. So uh, that's, that's, those are some of the choices that I made early on. And that was, I'm very happy for the two of you that you were able to see the punch in the gut when you were like, oh, I've answered this question five times. I just learned, recently learned that, as I've mentioned before, my mom is still quite verbal, but none of it makes sense. It's, it's, and it's a sentence, but it's, it's like different pieces of memories put together in a sentence, and it's like, what is she talking about? And I'll scrunch up my face, like thinking like, you know, I'm trying really hard to understand what she's trying to tell me so that I can respond to her in a positive way. And that scrunching up on my face thinking, hmm, what is she saying? Other people have interpreted it, it as anger, which I don't understand because to me it looks like confusion and it is confusion and it's not anger, but she interprets it negatively. As soon as I you know, go like, hmm, you know, you think of the thinking emoji, she gets irritated. And so I have to, I've just learned it is irrelevant what she's trying to tell me. I just agree. Oh yes, that sounds interesting. Oh, uh-huh. Oh, really? Okay. Which is difficult because I need a little bit more stimulation than that. But if I if I try to figure out what she's telling me and I scrunch up my face in, in what I think is like the hmm face is the best way I can describe it on verbally, she gets ir irritated and it's very, very obvious. And she's very, very responsive to very subtle body language. That, I've learned that the hard way. <laughs> that's just what I was trying to say, that he, he was responsive to, to a raised eyebrow. And that's why we have to do, not have to, we, I try to do as much as we can to give tenderness and kindness. Uh, shall I give you a couple of examples of some yeah. of the things I learned? Okay. Um, uh, one of the things that I think is unique about my book, Choosing Joy, is that every time, especially in the early years, every, every time I did something that worked, I ask myself afterwards, why did that work? What, what was the underlying principle behind what I did accidentally? <laughs> okay. And, um, and I'll give you some examples. Uh, we had, uh, the, first, uh, the first years, uh, uh, a lovely, wonderful housekeeper who came in three times a week. And one morning, uh, she was there, and I came into the bedroom, and had she said in a nice, cheery voice, Mr. Berger, your breakfast is ready, 
I would have thought that was lovely. <laughs> What's wrong with that? Exactly. She didn't do that. What she did was say, Mr. Berger, are you ready for breakfast? And my jaw dropped with what she just did. And what the difference is between your breakfast is ready, which is an implied, no matter how sweetly you say it, it's an implied command. Your breakfast is ready. You have to come and eat now. What she did is give him a choice. She gave him a choice. Are you ready? And he would say, yes. And I, I was stunned by her brilliance. And I changed almost everything I said to him in the next four years to a question. None of us, not ourselves, our husbands, our, our children, our children, especially our grandchildren, nobody wants to be told what to do all day long. And whatever field the person is in, whether they're driving a truck or the president of a bank or, or, or a doctor, nobody, we all rebel when we're constantly told what to do, especially if someone was in a position of authority. And suddenly he's being, so, the ring through his nose being revolved uh, And that was probably one of the biggest changes. And by the way, what I learned from Lisette, I constantly was observing everybody around me and learning from everybody because every time I saw something. So by the way, what I told you, the principle, the principle of that was simply question versus command. And it was at night, would you like to watch this movie, that movie, the other movie? And, and the choices that I gave him were always fine with me. I, whatever they were, the, the answer was going to be fine. But all that initial anger stopped because he was making the decisions. He wasn't being told what to do. So here's something that I learned from him. Pressure, and by the way, later on, after he fractured his hip, I had, I had no extra help for the first uh, three, three plus years until he fractured his hip. And then I had no choice. He actually was in a wheelchair after that. He never really walked, even though he had the hip surgery. And um, we, we, ha we keep learning, but, but learning from everybody. I'll, I'll give you another one, if you wish. Um, I, I do. Can I interject I one thing really quick? Yes. Most of the time I've read and heard, you know, don't ask too many questions because it frustrates them, which can be true. And back in September, so this is six or seven months ago, my mom and I were at her neurologist appointment. Her neurologist is a fantastic woman, takes a lot of time with her patients, and is therefore always significantly behind schedule. Mm -hmm. And my mother does not wait patiently. So I went in, I told them we are here. How far behind is the doctor? Because we also ended up there early, which compounded the problem. And they tried to kind of pretend she was less behind than she was, which was nice. But I said, mom does not wait patiently. We are going across the parking lot and we're going to get something to drink. Either call or text me when you'd like me to start heading back this way. And they were great, great with that. Great and idea. pardon me? That was a great idea. Yes. Well, she just gets really agitated and then I'm agitated and the people around us and it's just this cascading agitation and that's just bad for everybody. So I'm like, you know, we're in this, not really a strip mall, but in a, a complex with medical buildings and small restaurants. So we went to this hamburger place. Neither one of us needed food. And so I asked her, would you like an iced tea or a Diet Coke? And she goes, you have whatever you want. And I said, oh, thank you. Okay, I'm going to have iced tea. Do you want iced tea or Diet Coke? And she said, oh, don't worry about it. It's okay. You do whatever you want. And she goes off on this rambling tangent of this hostessy speak that never gave me an answer. So I just ordered us two iced teas and called it a day. And from that moment on, it was September 16th, 2019, I stopped giving her A, B choices because I was under the, I believe, erroneous idea that an a B, because she wasn't able to give me a choice, it, was, it would frustrate her to just keep asking. But consequently, her 
combativeness increased, you know, not necessarily from the next day forward, but from September on, it got worse and worse. So if we are not in the position that we are currently in, which is I cannot see my mom because of this virus, and she is now bed bound until the leg heals, at which point she probably won't be able to walk. I don't know. It'll be interesting. My plan had been to go back to giving her A, B choices. Would you like iced tea or Diet Coke? Deal with her non-answers. And then what I didn't do back in September would be to say, oh, here's the, here's the iced tea you ordered, mom making it seem like she'd been asked a question, she'd made a choice, and here's the result. But unfortunately, I'm not sure I'm going to get that option at this point. But I, I found it interesting that by choosing not to, quote-unquote, irritate her with questions she was unable to answer, I think I may have accelerated the frustrations that led to the combativeness. So You're, you're bringing up a, a really important point because... It, there is not one size fits all for this. Obviously, what worked for me and my husband uh, is not working for you. I think it could have. I just needed to add a twist to it Be, because she's so very late stage. Mm. By by her not giving me an answer, you know, you'd think she's she's not good with yes or no either. So because she's unable to give an, an answer to an a b question or a yes or no question i stopped asking questions and i think it came across as controlling like you were saying so it's of course you know i now have figured this out in hindsight and i don't think the combativeness is going to go away but it's just i wanted to throw that out there because we do hear frequently that you know don't ask them if they want breakfast or don't ask, you know, don't ask too many questions in a row because sometimes it feels, um, what's the right word? You know, like if you come in, Oh, good morning, Mr. Burger. How did you sleep? And are you ready for breakfast? Blah, blah, blah. And it just, it feels almost like an attack. They're, you gotta give their brain some time to process. So just her asking the one question, are you ready for your breakfast now? Gave him time to process and answer did he ever say no? Uh, no. <laughs> <laughs> That's very interesting. Yeah, it was, he, was, he was just from, from day one, I, I never, I know people uh, have written, I've written uh, we've both written tons of books, and many people find that a white lie works. It's in the, your dresser and the dress is not there, they're in the hospital or something, and they, they say, uh, okay. Uh, my... From day one, I, I, I couldn't tell him a white lie. And because of that, he trusted me. He knew that, you know, he knew. And, and it, it went such a long way because from day one, I never bent the truth to him. I hadn't been in all my years of marriage, and I wasn't about to start then. And, and, and of course, he, he was a kind, gentle, very bright man. And he reacted to that. And later on, when he kept transferring financial responsibility to me, it was because he had absolute trust that I was doing what was best for both of us. And so every case is different. That <laughs> is different. true. It would be so nice if we could put it, here are the rules, do this, <laughs> fine. No, I had my experience, you have your experience, and they're totally different. And, and I just, we have to glean from each other what, what we can. Exactly. And that's why I like to talk to everybody I can because of the, and I, I don't talk about current events too often because I'm blessed with the episodes not going stale, but this is March 24th, 2020. And most of the country is on mandatory shelter in place. I am in the San Francisco. And online, like we are right Yeah, now. for real. Fortunately, this is normal for me. So this is like... Okay. This is um, basically back to normal, but not being able to go to the gym and all my other normal stuff. Yesterday, our Rotary Club met online the same way we're doing for the first time because we can't meet in person. So a lot of my life is completely different than it was a month ago. Mom's is completely different than it was a month ago. So it's like very crazy. And earlier today, I was feeling very 
down because I can't see my mom. I can't do the things that I feel I need to do for her. And I have learned through past guests to embrace that feeling. Okay. There isn't anything I can do about it. And so I just decided I'm going to even, I'm going to make an extra effort to do what I can for the listeners. Some of which are stuck at home with loved ones and they're not allowed, they're not allowed to go out. So they can't go to the adult day programs. Some of them, their caregivers are not coming in. I mean, it's just a disaster. So I feel as if my situation is, it's still negative. Um, I don't know what's going to happen. <laughs> I've made the comment, if my mom dies while well, I can't see her, it's going to be pretty ugly. But I understand <laughs> that's what we need to do. It's an ugly time. It is very. So lost my train of thought, which I absolutely hate. Okay. <laughs> I went on a tangent. Let me, let me, let me come in with, um, uh, you asked, uh, we were discussing before you asked about um, uh, some of the things we did. And one of the most important things we did that kept him that way uh, was keeping an active mind. And he never was sat in front of a TV set all day that was rationed. 45 minutes a night, and, he, and usually he would want to watch, and he made the choices what he wanted to watch, usually musicals. And in the beginning, he watched 24, and it was too violent for him, and he stopped. Um, but um, I encouraged, it, it, he was, every minute of his day was programmed. He had a very busy day, and every minute of it was set. And the, the fact that he knew what was going to happen all the time made a tremendous difference. I remember early on, we had a, a personal trainer come in. We had a general trainer come in. And the woman was quite good, but she was fitting him into a schedule. And every day she could come in 11 this day and three that day. And it wasn't working. He needed, he needed the routine. He needed to know what to expect. And by the way, all over the house, we had charts of what was happening every minute of the day. So he always knew. But um, some of the things that we did to keep his mind active, I turned to activities that he once did and enjoyed. I turned to brand new activities uh, and tried different things. Some worked, some didn't. For example, he, um, he used to play the piano beautifully. Um, and Beethoven, and Mozart, and Bach, and Brahms, and, and, and he stopped after he fractured his, uh, before he fractured his hip. He stopped, when he was diagnosed, he stopped playing. And I didn't want to push it. But maybe third year in, into it, to one day and said, you know, honey, you, you used to love playing the piano. You got so much pleasure out of it. Why, why, did you, why aren't you playing? My fingers don't work anymore. I said, well, maybe your fingers don't work because you stopped playing. And would you give me 10 minutes a day and see how it goes? I said, Okay. Within two weeks, he was at that piano an hour a day, smiling and beaming and enjoying. And I just had to open that door a little bit for him, and he walked in. There were other things that he had never done in his life, like drawing. I shouldn't say that. He was an engineer, and he knew, uh, he knew how to draw straight lines and, and floor plans. That, that he was good at. But drawing, color, never, never, never. And one night after dinner, I put a huge pad of fresh uh, drawing paper and crayons and markers and pens. And I said, draw something. And he looked at me like I had lost it. <laughs> he said, what? And I, didn't, I, didn't, I, don't, I never knew what was going to come out of my mouth. It wasn't that I planned this ahead of time. I said, draw whatever makes you happy. And he looked at me. And he started drawing. Primitive. It got more advanced uh, later, on, later on. And virtually every night, not only did he draw, but he was so proud of them that he signed and dated them. In fact, the picture on the cover, I don't want to get the book over. Whoops. Here's, here's the copy. Here's the copy of his book. And I don't know if you can see it in this light, but the it's choosing joy, Alzheimer's a book of hope, and the face of the sun 
The smiling sun in the middle was one of his drawings two months before he passed away. And you couldn't draw, and that one, by the way, every now and then he'd label them. That one he actually labeled, and he called it Happy Sun. <laughs> so this was not done by a graphic artist. This is one of, one of his, and throughout the book, there's, it's loaded with his drawings and his answers to questions and, and, his, and his later on little letters to me. So everything I tried didn't work at first. Sudoku, he was a math, he always talked of himself as a mathematician. And I tried Sudoku and he was so confused by boxes and where which numbers go there that it was frustrating him and we let it go. When I saw him doing better a couple of years later, I thought, I'm gonna try that again. And he loved it. He was, he was, his mind was getting better. And we I, I never gave him an answer, but I sat with him, which didn't hurt. <laughs> he loved the company. And so all these different things that some worked, some didn't, some we came back to. And, um, and one of the things that was really important for him, as I indicated, he loved classical music. And we had concert series to so many things. But, but it, even if it was baseball that someone loved or, or a football game, so he loved, he was used to going to music. And what that did for him, because he, in the last few years when he was in the wheelchair especially, we always had a seat on the aisle so that we could, he'd get in and out of the wheelchair easily. And we would always get there early so it wouldn't disturb anyone. And he sat there like a king holding court. All the friends, because everybody had the same series, all the people would come over and just say a quick hello. How are you doing? And a smile. And it was his social life without putting the strain on our friends. Let's go out for dinner and have him go through dinner for an hour. And that, so every one of these activities gave, gave him something else that was, that was really important. And on his own, I must say, I actually was in my office uh, doing some work. And I came out and found a little love note from him. And I praised him up to the sky. And at, legitimately, I wasn't putting it on. I was just so touched. And that became from him, whether I was occasionally out or at home, I would have a little love letter. Little ones, some of them were in the book, and left, left for me. And I let me tell you, it was really hard. I had hundreds of his drawings hundreds of his notes and it was very hard to limit it in the book because I could have a book of just his drawings. Um, but, but all of them, especially the drawings, show uh, from this man who said, I don't want to live anymore, to the, 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 their, their drawings are whimsical and, and have perspective and they're just, they're all, the, the, when you drew our house, the house had, had a smile. It's they just reflect as as they do in kids. You know, when when kids are very young, the psychiatrists want to see their drawings, and they know they know where their mind is. So these were some of the things that we did to keep his mind active. So I have a couple questions. Sure. Was he always open to new things and new ideas? As no, a, no, interesting. No, hmm. Because I'm trying to figure out why he was. My mom was always very creative. She was a seamstress. She painted. She did woodworking. And have you introduced that stuff back to her? I tried. Was a a total failure. Not, because, not the woodworking. <laughs> oh God, no. no, this was just basic. Um, and and a creative, a little creative project for the grandchildren two and a half years ago. Um, just with ink pens, real simple. Just basically scribble inside these hearts, and I dropped um, alcohol on them, so it's a cheap version of alcohol inks. <laughs> and I did not know at the time that her visual processing was so shot, and that was causing complications. I then erroneously thought that she could sign them, love grandma. Uh, I was very lucky after 30 minutes or so to coax her into just signing her initials. And we're talking three little tiles. So I'm not, I was not asking her to write a love note. So I'm very, I'm, it's interesting. Like 
I have guests whose family members get in the later stages and are no longer verbal. My mother is certainly very verbal, for better or worse. And but she couldn't she couldn't sign. I don't think she could put an X on a piece of paper at this point. And your husband was writing notes to you up until the night before he passed away. So I find that very interesting. But I'm I'm picturing you put this paper with pens and crayons and stuff down in front of him. I just, I figured he was probably very open to like, oh, well, this is a new experience. Let me try. But you said he's not. So that's very interesting. No, no. Uh, he, uh, he was very, he, he was very set in his ways for his entire life. And I, uh, he ate the same breakfast every day. And I, when, when he later on the last two and a half years after he fractured his hip, and we had, uh, I had, had to have people. I never had anybody at night, but I, I, I needed people in the daytime. And I, had, I made a list. Of, it was a big breakfast, but I'm not going to bore you with the list. But he wanted the same thing. And in the earlier days, uh, if we were invited out rarely to a brunch or something for an occasion, he would eat his regular breakfast home and not touch anything there. So in many ways, he was extremely set in his ways. Um, but uh, he was open to these things. I mean, how could you see that pad in front of you and not just fool around with it? And I gave him options. And as I said before with the Sudoku, I took it away when he wasn't doing it. But, um, I've tried Sudoku. I am not a mathematician. I've always been a creative, artistic person. Mm-hmm. I'm, I, the only, I, I laugh because I'm also a professional photographer. So I, can, I wow. can do adding and subtracting very well when there's dollar signs and decimal points. I can even multiply sometimes when there's dollar signs and decimal points. That is it. I am not into math. And I tried Sudoku partly because I have a very big family history of Alzheimer's. And so I thought, well, this would be a good brain challenge. It's hard. <laughs> yeah, I failed. I couldn't do it. I'm like, eh, I'll, do, I'll find other ways to stimulate my brain. Starting a podcast business was not on the list, but that's been very See? beneficial. <laughs> very <laughs> Well, many of us, not just yeah. <laughs> well, but. and just just so you know, prior to starting the podcast, I had a past guest that said she'd read a little blurb that I'd put on Facebook about an encounter with my mom at with my mom and another resident where she lives, and she said, "You know, you should write a book." And I said, "You know, I think I might," but I kind of assumed my mom had been in the care home for about six months. I thought, well, I probably should wait until she's gone. Well, I've just, I have changed that opinion. And I, so I've told people the book is in there. It's, it's inside here. I just have to wait for the right, when the right idea hits me, the idea will pop out and it will flow. Well, your book gave me that, that idea and the flow. Oh, that makes me so, so, so happy. Thank you. So the other question that I had, sorry, is I know one of the things that I learned recently with my mom, I had many, many guests that kept telling me, you know, you should stop going for two hours on Mondays and you should go for an hour on Monday and an hour on another, another day of the week. And it's, and I am very structured. I'm not set in my ways. I'm very structured. There was a reason that Mondays worked. I would go after our rotary meeting and then I could come home and, and it was when I would come home after visiting her, I was just wiped out. I, I could not deal with clients or anything. I just needed to just to be with myself, maybe the dogs and the husband. So I was not interested in taking two chunks out of my week that made it very difficult to function as a, I don't know, middle-aged adult. My grandmother's almost 102, so middle-aged. Oh, my goodness. Oh, yeah, I know. <laughs> but sometimes when I think about that, I get tired. Um, this would be my dad's mom. For most listeners, now I've talked about her a few times. I didn't, I didn't want to do that. So I finally got smart and said, you know what? I'm going to just do an hour on Mondays, and I, because of a lot of reasons, never managed to get the second day in. But she would get – I would notice that the longer we were together, the more – tired I would get mentally and she was getting tired. I didn't notice it until I started looking for it. And I, I read what you guys did every day and I think, okay, he had a, he had an afternoon nap, but how he did not just 
become frustrated from just being tired from all that activity? He slept very well um, and for uh, and, and long hours, and he also had that nap. He so he he got plenty of sleep. Okay, because I've noticed that you know the processing. It's like their brain is having to work so hard to do normal tasks, normal everyday living type tasks that they get tired really easily, even with just sitting and conversing, which is what I noticed with my mom. So obviously this is a, a very stark example of how Alzheimer's is so very different because of the person that it's affecting and where it in their brain it's affecting it's just i find it really fascinating in the beginning uh when uh, when it was very new before i introduced any of those things uh, he, as i said he was mad patient and he takes his he, his lungs were a problem and he had took certain breathing treatments that um and there, it doesn't matter what they are but he was stuck for 20 minutes several times a day and the beginning after the hip surgery when i had people come in to help um, I didn't want him sitting there 20 minutes twice a day with, with blank. And I remember going to Costco and getting the little kids' flashcards. And they would, I would I'd have them hold it for him, uh, put him up just to keep his mind busy even while he was doing this nothingness. And two plus two, and they had the answers on the back. Then it got more complicated, eight times six. But they were shy, and he, he, he got the answers out like that some very beginning. Uh, keep his mind focused, keep his mind focused. And then when he got used to it, and he does not speak Spanish, he knows. But he started answering them in Spanish because he was getting bored with it. <laughs> two plus two was four. So from the very beginning, I knew that if there's any hope, that mind, that brilliant mind had to be stimulated and, and not, in a, not in a frustrating way, and he enjoyed it. It was like, and he was so, and the nurses couldn't believe how he had his answers out so fast. And he loved it. He wanted to show off and, and do more. Of it. But surrounded anybody who came to help who wasn't giving him what, and as I say, remember, I didn't have anyone for the first three and a half years, and I never had anybody at night. It was just, I, I, I in order to function. And, and by the way, I'm going to interrupt myself to say <laughs> that was a mistake. When I had the help, that I needed in the daytime. I realized in retrospect that I made a big mistake not to have it earlier. Because when I could get out for a game of tennis or a walk or, or, or some activity, of just even a way to read a book for a while, um, I came back and was ready to give him my all. And I did. Without that, Negative emotions start to creep in, and there, there's resentment, there's anger, there's impatience, irritability, all those things, and they're going to creep in if you're doing this 24-7. They can't not. So I realize in retrospect, I should have done it a lot earlier, and given, even if it was two hours a day, getting a, a, a high school student in to play chess or checkers with him or something. It doesn't have to be a trained, you know, licensed uh, nurse to come in at this stage. Uh, but you, uh, and a part of it is that you asked me before, what did you do to take care of yourself? Mm -hmm. I, I realized too late, but, but I'm, you know, still, still okay, that, uh, that I had to give myself an out. And it made a very big difference. For me, uh, the most difficult part in the beginning was that I felt guilty for doing that, and it's a tough thing to get rid of. Uh, and I, I allowed myself, not often, um, but I allowed myself, if I invited to, to a big function, which he always hated anyway, or, or to something, a movie. Uh, friends would say, come to a movie with us. Movies he couldn't handle because it was too much going on, he just he couldn't do it. And in the beginning, I have to admit, I was, what will people think? What will we think? She, her husband's home and she's doing this with us. And I, it was a very foolish thought, but it was there loud and clear. And um, 
he got the opposite reaction. I cannot tell you how many, many, many people came to me, people I barely knew, and said things like, you are handling this so well. And I thought, they're not judging me that I'm doing this terrible thing. <laughs> And, um, and, you know, people, people observe, they watch, they, they see that you, that you don't even realize. I remember after he was gone, I don't know her name, but a woman who sat behind me at one of the concerts, who heard that he was gone, or saw that he was gone, said something like, um, Nobody ever took, she, I don't even know her name, I and mean, she never saw me in action. She said, nobody ever took care of a husband like you do. And I looked at her, I, I was so shocked that I blurted out, how, how do you know that? <laughs> like, you know, <laughs> how do you know that? And I can't believe I would say something like that. She said, I've sat behind you for years. I've watched how you treat him. I've watched the gentleness, the tenderness. She said, I know how you, I know how you handled him. And that was such a, a special moment because people are with you. People aren't judging you for going out or judging you for doing something. People, people want you to do well. And they all saw the result from, from him. They, as, as those friends in the concert would come over and visit, more and more, he started greeting them by name. It's to my shock. And of course, every time he did that, I praised him and praised him and praised him. That's what, how do you know that? I mean, and he, he wanted to show me show off, so he kept trying to remember people's names. It was the sweetest thing. But uh, taking care of yourself is, is essential. And because if you don't, you don't have it to give. And even the walk, exercise, and exercise is what they're telling everybody today with the virus. If you don't continue your exercise, you're going to go downhill fast. Yep. And, um, and it's, it's crucial. And especially I'm in Miami now, and it's still sunny and, and, and beautiful and not too hot. And um, I make it my business every day. Um, it's a beautiful walking path in the apartment that I live in. And, and um, but you gotta take you got to take care of yourself in order to be able to give. Well, I'm sure you've heard that analogy. You have to put the oxygen mask on yourself before you can put it on the children. Because if the plane is going down and it depressurizes and you can't breathe, you can't help them even if they can breathe. So it, you know, it does make sense. It is, it is very difficult to do. I struggle with that issue. And I, my mom is in a residence. And just two things on taking care of yourself. One, a decade ago, I went on a journey to get healthier, to lose a lot of weight because on my dad's side of the family, it's a lot of diabetes, and I'm very grateful that I had somebody in my life that triggered a little. It was a client who was a doctor, and she said, you're overweight, you have a family history of diabetes, you're screwed, and the term you're screwed fired me all up, and I'm like, I'll show you, which is a very typical trait on my mom's side of the family. <laughs> uh, so you can kind of get a hint how my mom is. And I lost all the weight, and I learned, there was one day I went to the gym, and it was one of those days I just walked in, <laughs> just steam coming out of my ears. Just you can get the visualization, I'm sure. And my trainer said, Is everything okay? And I said, It will be in an hour. And I was <laughs> done with the spin class. And I said, All is fine with the world. I do not feel homicidal anymore. And she laughed <laughs> and I laughed. And and one other tip about taking care of yourself, well, it's kind of two tips. One, you gotta do it. You got to do it to preserve your own cognitive health and your, you know, your sanity. And as I mentioned earlier, you know, my mom was in the hospital and the hospice people who are helping take care of her in the care home said, um, you know, what time can you meet so-and-so at the hospital or at the, at her residence? And I, you know, did that. Well, I can't do quick mental math, but I calculated what time I'd get home from the gym, shower, dress, get to the hospital. I eliminated the shower dress part because that would just take too long. And I told them because I'm like, I have missed this class more times this year and I'm going. And if anybody cares that I'm going to take this hour to go to this workout, if they have a negative opinion, 
they can just they can just go somewhere else because I'm Good not going you. to listen to it. Good for you. <laughs> my whole attitude is if they don't understand how important it is for my mental health, my cognitive ability, my sanity to be able to deal with my mom. And like I said, I don't have her in my home like you did. They can just go away. They can go judge somebody else because I'm just not having it. <laughs> Good for you. As they, say, as, as, as they say in Miami, you are numero uno. That is true. If I don't take and care I of myself, I mean, I have a, I have ever, a wonderful... Don't ever forget it. I have a wonderful husband too, but it's like, you know what? I'm in charge of my own life. I will take care of myself. We'll take care of each other. It's all good. So do you have any final thoughts you'd like to share with the listeners before I, I let you go? Sure. Um, I think, um, yeah. Basically, the essence of the book, Choosing Joy, and it's over and over and over in every page practically, the more we treat our loved one with kindness and respect, the less they will tend towards anger. And it sounds simple, but it's not. And the more reassurance we can give, the more we can allow those we care about to preserve their dignity. It's, it's so difficult, but there are many ways we can find to do it. All of us thrive on praise and, and um, appreciation. So the universal message that became clear with my experience with my husband is that, and this applies not only to Alzheimer's, it applies to anyone who's declining in any way, that, and by the way, I knew when I was writing the book that it was not just Alzheimer's, it was for anyone declining in any, any way. What I learned after writing it from my readers is, no, it's not just for someone's declining. And I said, Helene, you've written about how we treat all the people in our lives that we care about. So that's very, very special for me. So throughout my life, I've been really blessed to have major leadership positions in my community and, and nationally. And I must say, in, in all truth, that was this tough? You bet it. It was by far the most challenging, but the most rewarding position I've ever had. So I, I think I'll end as I kind of began, and that the most important message that I can impart, and I hope choosing joy um, d does impart, we are not automatically the hapless victims of fate. Our attitude and our actions can and do make a difference, that we really can choose to live with hope and with joy.